uh, Take the Plunge by Gloria Emerson. It was usually men who asked me why I did it. Some, some were Take the Plunge by Gloria Emerson. It was usually men who asked me why I did it. Some were amused, others puzzled. I didn't mind the jokes in the newspaper office where I worked about whether I left the building by window, roof, or in the elevator. The truth is that I was an unlikely person to jump out of an airplane, being neither graceful, daring, nor self-possessed. I had a bad, bad back, uncertain ankles, and could not drive with competence because of deficient depth perception and a fear of all buses coming towards me. A friend joked that if I broke my bones, I would have to be short because I would never mend. I never knew why I did it. It was in May, a bright and dull May, the last May that made me want to be reckless. But there was nothing to do then at the beginning of a decade that changed almost everything. I could not wait that May for six days to unroll. I worked in women's news. My stories came out like little cookies. I wanted to be brave about something not just about love or a root canal or writing that the shoes at Arnold Constable looked strangely sad. Once I read of men who had to run so far, it burned their chests to breathe. But I could not run very far. Uh, jumping from a plane which required no talent or endurance seemed perfect. I wanted to feel the big puzzling clump on my back that they promised was a parachute. To take serious strides in the absurd black boots that I believed all generals wore. I wanted all of it, the rising of a tiny plane with roof or the earth rushing away, the plunge, the slap of the wind, my hands on the back steps, the huge curve of white silk above me, the drift, as they drift through the space we call sky. It looked pale green that morning. I fell into it. Not the baby blue I expected. I must have been crying. My cheeks were wet. Only the thumps of a wild heart made noise. I did not know how to keep it quiet. <clears throat> <clears throat> That may, that may, my mind was as clear as clay. I did not have the imagination to perceive the risks, to understand that if the wind grew nasty, I might be electrocuted on high tension wires, smashed on a roof, drowned in water, hanged in a tree. I was sure nothing could happen because my intentions were so good just as young soldiers start out certain of their safety because they know nothing. Friends drove me to arrange massacre sets, 70 miles west of Boston, about the opening of the first U.S. sports parachuting center, where I was to perform. It was the creation, the passion of, of a Princetonian and ex-married named Jacques Easter, who organized the first U.S. jumping team in 1956. Parachuting was as safe as swimming, he kept saying, calling it the world's most stimulating and soul-satisfying sport. 
He sent us for competitions and the teaching of skydiving instead of hurtling toward the earth skydivers maintain a swan dive position using the earth as a cushion to support them like uh, while they maneuver with leg and arm movements until the rib cord must be pulled None of that stuff was expected from any of us in the little beginner's class. We were only to jump after brief but intense instruction. We distilled the newly designed parachute to show that any dope could do it. It was a parachute with a 32-foot canopy, a large cutout hole funneled escaping air. You steered with two wooden knobs instead of having to pull hard on the back straps or risers. The new parachute increased lateral speed, slowed down the rate of descent, reduced oscillation. We were told how we could even land standing up, but that we should bend our knees and lean to one side. The beginners jumped at 8 a.m. The expert skydivers performed the dazzling tricks later when a crowd came. <clears throat> two, us, two of us subordinated a Cessna 180 um, that lovely morning. The wind no more than a ticker. It was not myself, no longer thin, uh, no longer fast. The jumpsuit, the equipment, the helmet, the boots had made me into someone thick and clumsy, moving as strangely as if they had put me underwater and said I must walk. It was hard to bend, to sit, to stand up. I did not like the man with me. He was eager and composed. I wanted to smoke, to go to the bathroom, but there were many straps around me that I did not understand. At 2300 feet, the hateful happy man went out making a thumb, making a dumb thumb up sign. <clears throat> when my turn came, I suddenly felt a stab of pain for all the forgotten soldiers who barked and were kicked out, perhaps short for their panic and panic and of delaying the troops. I was hooked to a static line, an automatic opening device which made it impossible to lie down or lie myself or tie myself to something. The drill master could not to hear all that I shouted at him, but he knew the signs of mutiny and re removed my arms from his neck. He uh, took me to the doorway sat me down and yelled, go, or now, or out. There was nothing to do but be punched by the wind, which knocked the spit from my mouth, reach for the wing, strut, hold on hard, kick back the feet so weighted and helpless in those boots, and let go. The parachute opened. After the plop, as the Eastern had promised to me that it would. When my eyelids opened as well, I saw the white gloves on my hands of old old ones from Saks, Saks Fifth Avenue, gloves I wore with summer dresses. There was dribble on my chin, my eyes, my nose were leaking. I wiped everything with the gloves. There was no noise. The racket of the plane and wind had gone away. The cold and sweet stillness seemed an astonishing undreamed of gift. Then I saw what I had never seen before, will never see again, endless sky and earth in colors and textures no one had ever described. 
Only then did parachute become a most lovable and docile toy. This was not to go. Go left. This was not to go right. The pleasure of being there, the drifting and the calm rose to a fever. I wanted to stay pinned in the air and to stop the ground from coming closer. The target was a huge arrow in a sand pit. I was cross to see it. Afraid of nothing now, even the wind was kind and the trees looked soft. I landed on my feet in the pit with a bump, then sat down for a bit. Later that day, I was taken over to meet the other James Garvin, who had led the 82nd Airborne in the DJ landing at Normandy. Perhaps it was to prove to him that the least promising pupil, the cockiest, could jump. I did, it did not matter that I stumbled and fell before him in those boots, which walked uh, with the will of their own. Later, Mr. Estill's mother wrote a charming note of congratulations. Everyone at the center was pleased in fact, I'm sure they were surprised. Perhaps this is what I had in mind all the time.